You know, Easter poses a, a dilemma. Christmas poses a, a dilemma, too. But sometimes I think you kind of got to just sit down, which I'm going to do for just a second, and decide what you're going to do about it. Because Christmas, you know, we decide that, you know, we're going to give all kinds of gifts and presents, and that's good on you, whatever you want to do. Uh, you know, there's, you got Santa, you got Jesus, you got the tree, I, you know, we got a secular, we got a spiritual, we got a Christian, we got a Catholic, we got a something. But the church has got to decide who the church is going to be, what the church is going to believe, not just about Christmas, but about life, and ultimately Easter, because Christmas is one thing. Christmas without Easter means nothing. Honestly, the resurrection is, is the be-all to end-all for Christianity. Our eternity hinges on the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. And yet, we just watched a video that I, I just, can I be frank, honest? I didn't want to show, and for the last couple of years, I've said we're not going to show that video. And you know Why? It's not because it's a bad song. It's a great song. It's because we have a tendency to worship the cross in lieu of the resurrection. So we wear the crosses. We've got the crosses on our Bibles. And there's a place for the cross. Don't mishear me. But everything that you believe hinges on whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. Nothing else matters in our lives. Because if he didn't rise from the dead, if he didn't defeat Satan, if he didn't defeat death, then we are hopeless. And I tell you what, I'm not hopeless. I live full of hope every single day, no matter what life brings, no matter what God allows in my life. And there I get discouraged, I get depressed, I get, I get angry, just like all of you do. Because you, we're human beings, right? We all have emotions, we all have faux pas, we all have habits that we wish we didn't have, and a past that maybe we could, we could whitewash and redo. But because of what Jesus did at Calvary, three days after going into the tomb, means that you and I have the opportunity to be white as snow. That when... when when John, the, the writer of the gospel and the three letters, says that you are born again, not of spirit, not of blood, but of spirit, that's affirmed in what Jesus did at Calvary when he rose from the dead. When that tomb was, was, was found empty, all of a sudden, there's hope that, that we couldn't even begin to imagine. And it's because of what Jesus did. Yes, the cross had a place. The crown of thorns had a place. The spear in his side had a place. The apostles had a, had a, a place. Pilate had a place. Herod had a place. Everybody had a role and a place. But Jesus is the only one, when it's all said and done, that mattered. Because everything else falls in line with Jesus. If you've got a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 23. The reality of the crucifixion is the reality of the cru crucifixion. Jesus, Jesus had to die. The Old Testament tells us through, through, through the prophets, through, through what we call the scarlet thread, from the beginning of Genesis to the very end of the last book, the last verse of the Old Testament, that God was going to provide a Messiah, a person who would die for the sins of humanity. And in order for that to happen, Jesus had to live a sinless, perfect life. He's the Son of God. He's all God, but He's all man. And He, with His Godhood, his real person, he intentionally gave his authority and placed it in the hands of the Father. And he said, I will only do what the Father leads me to do and the Father tells me to do. He never lost his divinity. He never stopped being God. He simply humbly submitted himself to the will of, of God, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit would speak through him. But he never stopped being God. 
So we can't forget that. That Jesus was always God. When he came in the flesh, he was God. When he was nailed to the cross, he was God. When he was put in the tomb, he was God. When he rose from the grave, the tomb, from the dead, he was God. When he ascended into heaven, he is God. And he is still God today, and he will always be God. Amen? Because, see, that's, that's what makes life possible. And I know as Christians, we, we get in this, this, this mode, I just got to get through the day. I just got to get through the day. Tomorrow will be better, right? A toy falls on the floor. A car, you know, just won't start. Your wedding and your car won't start. Oh, and your husband-to-be's car won't start. And you're late for your own wedding. You lock your keys in your car. You hit a moose. You go bankrupt. Does Jesus stop being Jesus because all those things happen? Never. I want to read, if you will, in verse 33 of Luke chapter 23. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. How many of you know this story? Raise your hand if you know the Easter story. It's just about all of us, and you know, of, who are of age. We... We kind of know the story, right? We know that there were some thieves that were on the opposite side of Jesus. And the one said, you know, uh, you know, Jesus, how about if I just read it? Can I just read it to you? Can, would that be all right? Okay, here we go. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanging there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Really, how can you say what you're saying? Don't you realize that you're going to die on the same, on the same hill that he's going to die? Where's your, where's your dignity? Where's your spirituality? I guess you don't get it, huh? I guess you don't get it. But only one would get it, right? And one would not. The one that God had said this, and he said, And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man, the one in the center, has done nothing wrong. And this is what he said. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, if there's, if there's a kingdom to be had, if there's any hope to be had, I'm going to trust that it's you. I'm dying here. But Jesus, I'm trusting that it's you. And if, if it's real, if you are who, who, who you proclaim to be, who, who they say you proclaim to be, who, who, who you might be, would you just remember me? And you know what the coolest part about this whole thing is? Is that God said that was enough. That's all he had to do. I don't get it. But there was some, some belief. There was some, some humility. There was something in that man's words, in that man's disposition, in that, man, in that man's face, in that man's heart, that God said, that's enough. Right? Yeah. So why do we make it so hard? And we do. 
We make it nearly impossible for people to believe. You got to do this. Ray, you did not wear a tie today. You did not wear a tie last week. You did not wear a tie week the week before. You haven't worn a tie in 25 years except for weddings and funerals. Now, I believe that a pastor is supposed to wear a tie, and if a pastor doesn't wear his tie, I'm not sure he's saved. I've heard that before. Trust me. Ladies, oh, you don't have a dress on? Oh, oh, shame, shame, shame. You're supposed to wear a dress. Men, you're supposed to wear beards. Never cut your hair. Never pluck your eyebrows. No, 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 no. You got to have a King James Bible. Only the King James will do. doesn't matter that it's flawed. Just in its translation, it's the Bible. It's fully God, fully his word. But we have a better grasp of the language. The NASB is, is flawed, but it's still God's word. You know why it's flawed? Only because humanity translated it. And we have choices to make. It doesn't make it any less God's word. We stand on the promises of God. But we get to stand on the promises of God because of what Jesus did at, at Easter. Because we choose to believe. We choose to be the man that uttered those words. Jesus, if there's a place, remember me. Remember me. Jesus answered him in verse 43, and he said to this man, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Truly today you will be in, with me in paradise. Verse 44 begins a new, a new paragraph, a new thought, and it says, It was now the sixth hour and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now they're using the Jewish time frame, so it's from noon to three. Life goes dark. No, it was not an eclipse. Not, it's, no. Historians, scientists, they, they, they've, they've, they, they've all done the work that, that you and I just can't do. This was God. The veil was torn. The Son of Man, the Son of God, the only Son of God, died on a cross for you. It was now the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour, because the sun was obscured and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. And all of a sudden, all that God had put in place was finished. I think John says, actually, that Jesus uttered the words, it is finished. God's purpose, God's plan for redemption was, was perfectly completed in Christ. Verse 47 says, Now when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds came together for this spectacle. When they observed that what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance saying these things. It's finished. Jesus is dead. Now, if you weren't a follower of Jesus, you thought he lost. Right? Because death equals loss. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to read next points to, to the reality, reality that even those that followed him really were unsure. They wanted to believe, but they were unsure that what they were believing had happened. So let me read verse 50. Because there was a man, and his name was Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, a man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who was waiting for the kingdom of God. 
This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen cloth and laid him in a tomb cut out of the rock where no one had ever lain. It was preparation day. And the Sabbath was about to, to begin. The women who had come with him out of Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. So they went to go see Jesus. Do you remember what they brought with them? Do you remember what they brought with them? They returned and prepared spices and perfume. And on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. So why, why spices and perfume? Because they expected Jesus to be dead. They did not expect to find the tomb empty. And so what they did was they basically prepared the burial spices so that, that they could treat him properly. They hedged their bets. I can't fault them, or I can't fault them. I mean, how many people biblically have been raised from the dead? Exactly. One. Before now. <laughs> Remember his name? Lazarus. Come forth. Lazarus. Excuse me. La oh, the wrong guy got up. Lazarus. Come forth. And then now Jesus. But Jesus. Okay, let me read on. Let me read on. But on the first day of the week, chapter 24, verse 1, at early dawn they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the, tomb, the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. While they were perplexed, behold, two men suddenly appeared suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were ter terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the, and the third day rise again? And they remembered the words. And they remembered the words. So they went expecting a body. What they found was, truly, that empty tomb meant there was a Savior. That empty tomb delivered what, what, what the angels certainly, or the men with dazzling clothing, the angels actually affirmed that empty tomb confirmed everything that they be ever believed about God, about salvation, about freedom, about eternity. Because Jesus was alive. Amen? We sing that song. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive, and I'm forgiven but it took, it took the resurrection for the cross to matter. It took the resurrection for, for the parting of the Red Sea in Genesis and Exodus, whichever one it's in. It took Peter walking on water and failing in his faith for any of that to make any sense or for any of that to truly matter in the scope of history, in the scope of God, in, 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 the, in, in the hope that we have that he is who he says that he is, that he's accomplished what he said he was going to accomplish. He arose. He arose. I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know what you believe. There's some of you that I, I, I don't know that I've ever met you before. I'm Ray, by the way. I'm old, tired. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm young, Joanne. Joanne said I'm young. That's right. But it's good, it's good to meet you. 
not knowing you and knowing you, here's, here's my, my prayer for you today. My prayer for you today is that you would know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That you would not worship the cross. That you would worship the risen Savior who died so that you could have hope. And if you're living today and you feel hopeless, I'm going to share with you just really quickly how you can know hope. See, there's this stuff that's in all of us called sin. Adam and Eve ruined the world for us. I, I mean, they just, they did. It's, it's true. But what, what, what Jesus accomplished at Calvary, that fixed it all. He said, now there's a, a place, a place that you can go a person you can turn to that will deal with that sin. And Jesus raises his hand and says, that's me. See, that place was the cross. I gave my life, my life for you on that cross, and I was buried in a tomb. And, and for three days, I, I, I did all that I did. And after that, that time was completed, I, I, I arose from, from that tomb. Alive. And with that living, I defeated death. And not only death, big whoop. I mean, it's big, but not for him. But I defeated the, all of the enemies of God. Satan, Lucifer. Defeated. All the guilt, all the shame that, that's, that's all taken care of in me. And he says, so here, do this. He said, I, I need you to, no, you need to. You need, you need to admit that you're a sinner. And it's this simple, that I've been living for self and not living for God. But me being for God, being God, Jesus would say, I deserve your worship. So admit that you're a sinner. Believe that I am God's son, that I am the Messiah, that I am the way, the truth, and the life that Paul writes about in Romans. And that no one comes to the Father except by me. And put your faith in me. And then just follow me, live for me. It really is that simple that we have to admit that we have a need for God. We have to admit that, that we're, we're, we're flawed, we're sinful. That Jesus has the power to cleanse us from that sin and to forgive us of that sin and, 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 and not leave us there to basically pick us up, to write us so that we can live a life that is, is fruitful, is, is, is full of, of value and full of joy. I, again, want to, want to go back to, to last Saturday at, at the memorial service for Lee. I was, I was so moved, and I said this last week, that God uses the lives that we live to touch the people that we're in contact with, but it begins at the very moment of salvation. And then we get to live the life that, that we want to live, and God says, but you can live it for me, and I'll bless you for it. So admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus is the way to salvation, that he's the Messiah. And then say, God, Jesus, I, I put my faith in you the best way I know how. I trust you, God, and I don't know what all this means. I don't know what it looks like. But I'm going to trust that you are who you say you are. God, forgive me. See, that's what the cross affords us. It affords us the picture, and the resurrection in the empty tomb is the caption that says, yep, it's done. So where are you this morning? I don't, I don't know where everybody's at, but he does. Blessed is he who has not seen and yet believes, is what Scripture says. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John writes, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our sin and un unrighteousness. Paul writes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. 
For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You want me to go on and on? Or why don't we just stand? Because the reality is, is that Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. And all to him you owe. We're going to sing a song. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and we're going to sing a song. I hope the words will be on the screen. This is coming from a piano, so we don't have to worry about that, hopefully. But let me pray for us. Grace of Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that we get to celebrate, even, even with the dilemma, even with, with the question of, is, God, how do we do this? You simply say, trust me. Follow me and allow me to do my work in you. Father, thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the gift of sonship and, and daughtership and, and family that we get to be followers of Christ and be a part of the family of God. Lord, is there someone here that doesn't know you that that is for maybe for the very first time striving, Father, to, to find hope that Lord, I know you're there for them, and I pray that they simply would do what, what we've mentioned. And Father, for those of us that have been followers of Christ, maybe for, for years and decades, Father, that we would allow you to speak truth into our lives, that we would, we would come back home if we wandered far. God, thank you for loving us. May we follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. May we honor you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a wonderful afternoon celebrating the resurrection of our Lord. Amen.